Good morning, everybody. Hey, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, it's really an honor, Sunir. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is going to be a fun journey. Hopefully, you'll, you'll enjoy this talk. I, I, I realized as I was coming up here that throughout the beginning starting phase of Sales Loft, I found myself in rooms like this many times. And, uh, and, and many of the, the lessons and, and uh, challenges that we faced were solved through uh, some of the leadership that I saw from talk. So if I could do anything like that today, uh, I'll be very happy. And my intent is that you're able to take away one tactical thing that you can put back into your business today and maybe one general philosophical idea that you can take with you throughout your journey and profession. Um, this is going to be a little bit different to talk in that it is all about our story and my story. So it, it starts off with uh, this guy uh, here in the middle. This is me when I was 11 years old. And this picture was never supposed to exist. I was born with a rare blood disease and wasn't expected to live past infancy. My entire childhood was spent with an IV in my arm every week and doctors telling my family that I wouldn't live. So this is a little bit of a miracle picture. This is actually the first picture taken after uh, my body started to produce blood cells and I no longer needed these types of treatments. So this is an important picture to me. Um, but it goes into the story a little bit because right after this miraculous cure of this blood disease, um, my life uh, changed. I had been living my life fighting relentlessly against this disease all the way up to age 11 and all of a sudden now it's gone. And, uh, and my life changed. And, and the way I describe it actually is I kind of went off a deep end. I went for a, a search for meaning in life and I, I thought I was responsible for curing this disease and I chased this path down of, of selfishness and self-serving philosophy. I was in and out of trouble all my entire childhood. Uh, this led all the way up to college where uh, I got in trouble with the law. I was arrested twice. And, uh, and I found myself in this moment where my life once changed just like it had when I went from having this disease to not, where I realized I had this, this moment of clarity in my family and, uh, and, and close friends and mentors helped me get there. But I realized that I had been chasing to find meaning kind of in myself. And, uh, and this plays into the bigger picture of, of the sales loft journey and what I mean by uh, the greatest advantage a company can have. But I came to realize that I had been given many talents and skills and capabilities, just like every single person in this room has unique talents and skills and capabilities. And this one fundamental change in my life was that I'm going to live the rest of my life taking these talents and skills and using them as best as I possibly can to serve others. And this ties in a little bit with this organizational advantage, as you'll see as we go on. Um, but I, I realized that I had entrepreneurial talents. I'd been in doing businesses and startups and selling things my entire childhood. In 1996, I'm from Atlanta. In 1996, the Olympics came to town, and I realized I could take my book bag, ride my bike to Walmart, load it up with Olympic pins that people would put on their shirts and jackets, and, uh, and sell them at Centennial Park for 2 to 5x what I had bought them for. And that was my beginning journey in sales. And I loved the look on people's eyes when they just, they just light up when you bring them something that they needed and something that maybe they couldn't get on their own or something they wanted to take home to their family. So I met these two guys. I, I knew I had entrepreneurial roots and I wanted to invest in that. And I wanted to be an entrepreneur as a way to serve and give back. And, and in Atlanta, uh, there's not a ton of technology startups, but there's a good bit now. And they're, they're more and more happening. Uh, but there were these two gentlemen that I saw and, and had met, and I really appreciated the, the way they worked. The guy on the left is David Cummings. Anyone know who David is? David writes a SaaS blog. He wrote uh, one post a day for a year or 10 years. I think you probably have all read at least one of his blog posts. Uh, but he was the founder and CEO of Pardot, Pardot that sold to Exact Target and later was part of the Salesforce $2.5 billion acquisition. And the guy on the right is Charles Brewer who was a little bit before David's time. He had founded uh, the largest ISP in the South. He was the CEO and founder of Mindspring and later Earthlink. And both of these guys represented this idea to me that I had never heard before, but I absolutely loved it. Here you have two wildly successful uh, technology entrepreneurs, and yet they said that their success didn't lie in their product market fit. It didn't lie in their uh, management style. It didn't lie in their ability to sell or go to market. And, uh, and Sunir might have thought that this greatest advantage was sales, but what they, what they tell, told me and shared with me is that organizational health and values, mission and vision, and alignment around that, inspiring a team and driving them to that and holding them accountability, that that was the greatest advantage a company could have. And uh, 
So I took all this knowledge and I started a company and I ran it straight into the ground. I burned about $250,000 of my investors' money, which was David Cummings, by the way. I didn't take his advice. I didn't take Charles' advice. I didn't even take the advice from the lessons I had learned and the philosophies that I had taken kind of going back to the disease and, and, and coming off of that. And, uh, and I, had, uh, I was a year into my business. This sales loft, uh, circa 2012. We had gone to the Techstars program in Boulder, Colorado. We had uh, uh, won, even won awards, in fact. Uh, but uh, we didn't have product to show for it, and we burned through all the money. And I realized that I had hired people that didn't align with my values. I had brought people on the journey that didn't have the same philosophical outlook as me. And I hadn't led this business, in fact, in the way that these gentlemen, my mentors, had trained and even taught me to do. And so I had to reboot the company. And what I did in that moment, this was January 2013, no revenue, no cash. Um, I went at, fortunately, I was going with no salary, so it didn't matter that we weren't burning that much money. Uh, and I was investing my own money in the business. But what I did is I said, I'm going to start this company over from scratch. And this time, I'm going to focus entirely on organizational health, on mission, on vision, on values. We're going to establish core values. And it doesn't matter what this business goes and does those are going to maintain and stay core to the company. So now, um, it's 2018, five years after that moment. Uh, Sales Loft has had dramatic growth in terms of revenue. We grew 120% last year. We'll grow 100% this year. Uh, customers are expanding at the rate of 120% annually, which means that they're uh, upgrading way more than they're downgrading or canceling. We've raised $70 million over three uh, professional financing rounds, including a round that we closed on last month, which was a $50 million round with Insight Venture Partners and LinkedIn as our investor. Along the way, we were ranked last year as the number seven fastest growing company in North America, according to Deloitte. Uh, Topo, which is a research and advisory company, has ranked us as the number one uh, software provider for sales phone and sales email. Number one in the category for G2 Crowd, a high Glassdoor rating, and just this morning, actually, Battery Ventures partnered up with Glassdoor and released the best cloud computing companies to work for in the world, and SalesLoft was ranked as number four. So what on earth was it that changed from this moment of running the company into the ground, no alignment with staff uh, to all this growth and, and all of these uh, accolades? which by the way, those are just the beginning of the accolades um, for, for, for the future of our company. But what changed was, is that I did take, and we did, me and David and, and my new co-founders, we did take this organizational values to heart. And we did inject them into every element of the business. And what I wanna do is I've got a few tactics uh, that I'm gonna share here today uh, that will help you see into how we did that. Now, of course, uh, there may be some, uh, some, some thoughts about survivorship bias on something like this, uh, but I've seen it in other companies. Uh, you see, if you look at the companies that won this year's Glassdoor, best cloud computing companies to work for, I've worked with many of these CEOs and founders, and they're building built-to-last companies, uh, not flash in the pan, uh, long-term, 40-year vision type approach. So the other thing, uh, by the way, was, um, well, there's, there's our core values, by the way, if you wanted to see them. Uh, it's always customer first. Uh, you know, there's three stakeholders in the business, owners, employees, and customers. Customers pay the bills, they pay everyone else. Other value is team over self. Uh, if you ever look at the, the um, stories of Michael Jordan winning his scoring awards before he started to be a team player, he never won a championship, uh, but he would win scoring awards. Um, bias towards action, of course, I think most entrepreneurs understand and get that one. It's important to roll that through the company as we're now 230 people to keep that part of the fabric of what you do. Uh, glass half full, this is one that's a little unique. It's a focus on positivity. Uh, we believe that, of course, you're going to have many ups and downs in your journey. Uh, and, and glass half full, what that means is not bullshit and like, hey, this is uh, all wine and roses, everything's nice and neat, but it's understanding fully all the challenges you're faced with and selecting the positive path forward, making that decision to select the positive path forward and then focus on the results. We have a formula for focus on the results. I'll rail it off real quick. It's open, transparent, and authentic. It means that we can dive in deep 
to work through problems, means we can commit to those problems, means that we can hold each other accountable. And when you have an environment of accountability, you can create and focus on results more than ever before. And then my favorite author, if you're writing anything down right now, write this name down, Patrick Lencioni. He's my favorite author, and this is his quote, the single greatest advantage any company can achieve is organizational health. The book he wrote is The Advantage. I get emails and, and calls from founders all the time asking for advice and suggestions on things. I go into my Evernote, I command A and copy all the notes I've taken from the book The Advantage, and I paste it in an email to them. And I say, start here and come back with questions, because this is the playbook for us and for our organization. And so now I've got a few ideas of things that we've done. Uh, hopefully some of these will apply to your business. If you have any questions on them, feel free to email me. I'm Kyle at salesloft.com, pretty simple. And uh, we'll get started with the first one, which is the one-page strategic plan. Every company, every entrepreneur should have a one-page strategic plan. Every, every nonprofit, anything you do, you should have a plan for what you're trying to achieve. This plan we started creating in January 13. I update this extremely frequently, and, uh, and it's the fabric of the entire business. I'll show you the components of it right now. So the first thing is a purpose. This is why you do what you do, right? And, uh, and it's really important to focus on that. I'm think, I think everyone's seen the uh, concentric circles. Um, uh, what's the guy's name? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, the guy with the glasses, Simon Sinek. Everyone's seen that, you know, the, with the apple with the Y in the middle. It's no bullshit. It's absolute truth, right? So dive in and figure out what that is. Then figure out how you will behave. Values. It's so interesting. Like, one of the things I learned from, from this journey is that entrepreneurs try to overcomplicate things. Uh, you know, living a business with organizational health, it's not complicated, but it's very hard to do. It's not, it's not complex, but it's very difficult, right? And if you think about it, as a business owner, as a CEO, our economy can change. We don't control that. The other technology in the marketplace can change. We don't control that economic trends, and so many things that can change that you don't control, but what you can control is we're coming together as a company with this purpose. You can control that 100%. We're going to behave this way. If we don't behave this way, then it's not going to happen, right? And so this is, these are the things that you have control over as a founder, and when you exercise that control and intentionally focus on it, uh, you can really make things happen. Uh, mission of the business, core strategies, uh, annual goals, quarterly goals, and then quarterly objectives, which we'll get into a little bit later, or I think on the next slide, actually. We originally started using um, this idea of priority projects, but shifted to OKRs. Anyone use OKRs? Uh, made popular by John Doerr and the team at Google. Uh, we switched to OKRs a few uh, quarters ago. By the way, here's, here's the core strategy of the business, and you can see the purpose at the top there. I already showed you the, the core values. Happy to share this with anyone. If you'd like, I can put it on uh, SlideShare as well. So OKRs, uh, we start with the company's objectives. We bring the ELT, the executive leadership team, together on a quarterly basis and decide what's most important right now for the business. Uh, there's no substitute for focus. And then those cascade to each and every, actually you can see it on these tabs, you can see my functional leaders' names, Christine, Sean, Allie, Bill. Each one of the functional leaders has their own tab in the OKR spreadsheet. Uh, Quick tip, by the way, if you control your domain, we make all these accessible through short URLs so that everyone in the company can easily see, oh, what's the one-page strategic plan? OPSP.salesloft.com. Oh, where are the OKRs? OKR.salesloft.com, right? So just a quick like, you know, tip on how to keep it in people's minds so they're always easily able to go there. I don't know if you know, you, you've got as many Google Docs as me, you go in there and it's just a nightmare. So we short link all the ones that we want people to remember and go to always. So now each functional leader creates their objectives, they create their results, they present these at our all hands, which you'll see in another slide, and, uh, and this allows us to stay hyper-focused on what's most important right now. Uh, there's a quote that startups don't, uh, what is it, they don't die of too many opportunities, they die of indigestion, or of, uh, you know, right? Like there's so many things we can do as a business, uh, but we need to narrow in on the ones that matter the most. So focus on three to four, uh, leaders have them, and it actually cascades all the way down to individual contributors. So my individual contributor sales reps on the floor, they don't just have quota, they have OKRs as well, and they're focused on them. 
The next is a weekly all hands. This is, uh, this is the all hands the day after we were announced number one best place to work in Atlanta. So you can see the balloons and the, and the, um, the champagne. Uh, but this is something that we've been doing since the beginning. We actually were originally doing it monthly and we moved it to weekly. And the whole concept here is bring everyone together. It's in a room just like this. Bring everyone together, get on the same page, celebrate wins together, talk about challenges, be super open and transparent. I do a, an ask me anything at the end of every all hands where you can ask me any question at all and I'll answer it. Um, so those are, this is the formula. Starts with an update. It's almost like my weekly sermon, right? I get up and I'm like, here's where the industry is. Here's where we are. Here's one thing we need to be thinking about as we try to tackle and attack our, our OKRs. Uh, new employees, let's introduce them all. We get them up on stage. They have to do funny things like uh, you know, answer questions like embarrassing moments and other things like that to connect with this, the team. Uh, Sales Off Star, we do this every week. There's a vote. There's a website where you go on and you vote for someone who's living the core values. Uh, we announce that person, bring them up. I, I read off all the comments that they received, and then we give them a, a gift. And then my part of our whole is someone in the company gets up for 10 minutes with uh, 10 slides or so and shows what they do for the business and how it lines all the way back to the purpose of the company. So they say, here's the purpose. Here's where my functional department comes in. Here's where my team comes in. Here's where I come in. And then I'm going to show you exactly how what I'm doing affects the business. And it could be an HR person. It could be a designer. It could be an accounts receivable person. It's anyone in the entire company gets up and they tell my part of our whole. And there's a really cool picture. I should have put it up here. It's, uh, it's the whole company as, a, as an image uh, broken out into puzzle pieces. And there's like a puzzle piece that's kind of taken out. Um, then product show and tell. We want to always be innovating for our customers. And so every single week, five product teams, we've got 10 now, five product teams in rotation get up and quickly, two minutes apiece, they say, here's what we're building, here's what we're working on, here's, here's how it's going to affect our customers. And what that does is that not only holds us accountable to innovation and delivering for our customers, but it also gets the whole team involved. And then me and my co-founder, Rob, will sit up on a stool for the last 15, 10, 15 minutes and, uh, and just let anyone ask any question at all. And I've probably gotten no shit, like 150 emails from employees saying that being a part of an organization that doesn't hide stuff from us, being part of an organization that's transparent and open and vulnerable and honest about where we are, about our struggles, about our challenges, about our opportunities, uh, it's a difference maker for, for staff. And so that's been a big, big, um, uh, important part of, of all hands. The weekend update, I, uh, I blacked out one piece because it was a a very, it had a customer specific name with a number in it. But uh, every Sunday night since the beginning of the reboot, back to that one day where I decided core values and organizational health were going to matter, every Sunday night, somewhere between eight and midnight, I send an email to the staff, I send an email to our investors and our mentors, and I BCC, you can't see it on there, I BCC my dad and I BCC my wife. Uh, but basically we break down what's happening. So hey, uh, last week of the quarter, uh, here's what we're doing. Here's what the, the, each functional team has been up to. Below that is the metrics dashboard. Here's how we're tracking towards our five most important goals. Uh, below that is someone who's exhibited the core values of the company. And then usually I leave some sort of inspirational educational thing. Here's a quote from someone. Here's a podcast I just listened to. Here's a snippet of a book. Here's a, an audible. You know, something to kind of get the team going. And this holds me accountable actually uh, to managing the business on this weekly cadence or rhythm. Oh, there's the, there's what's in there. So the next one, I think this is the last one, is values check interviews. We want to make sure that the staff that we bring on board fits the values of the company. Now, you may be excellent and you may be awesome, but you might not fit at sales off. That's not an indictment on you, it's just a matter of fit for the organization and the journey we're on. So we've taken 10 teams now, this is a little outdated, and we've created 10 co-ed cross-functional duos of people who were nominated by staff at the organization as the best exhibitors of core values of the company. And we put these people on a values check team. Every single interviewee goes through the values check team including C-levels. C-levels go through two values checks teams. And, uh, and so what they do is they have a blocking right on the candidate and they're trained specific 
to questions we've designed around the core values. So each of the six core values have a bank of about uh, six to ten core values questions for each of those values, and they're trained with the E staff on how to ask those questions and how to dig in and how to mine out whether they fit or not. So the last thing I'd say is, is um, you know, how do you know when you're, met, when you're operating on values? What's the measurement of being a, a values-driven company or organizationally healthy from this perspective? And, uh, and some people in the room might even know uh, Sales Loft as in the, in the early parts of our journey, we actually, our, our product was completely different than it is today. So after the reboot, we built a product called Sales Loft Prospector, and it was a data solution that would help you mine out information on the web. And our value was to inject, our, our purpose has been from the beginning to inject authenticity and sincerity into the sales process. And what we found is that this product did not align with our, our purpose. Uh, we found that people were using it in ways that were not, uh, not the same as how we had intended it to be used. And so uh, we took it from zero million to seven million run rate in a two year period of time. And I announced in November 2015 that we were going to totally discontinue the use of this product. We were going to stop selling it. We were going to start selling a brand new product that did align with the purpose. And I completely killed a $7 million business unit. Uh, you can find a, a, the article that talks all about it on the web. It says, we just stopped selling this, this uh, high performing SaaS product. Here's why. And it goes through all the details of how it doesn't align with our values. And then what's even cooler is you can find in the comments all the customers who loved it and asking a bunch of questions and I'm writing back, here's why, here's why we did that, here's why we did this. And it's all because it didn't align with where we were going as a business. And we couldn't, we could, I couldn't stand in front of you representing this company and representing our purpose with a product that we had like that out in the marketplace and say that I was doing my job. So now what we have is a sales engagement product. It's being used by 2,000 companies around the world, big companies like Cisco, Dell, MuleSoft, Facebook, uh, startup and, and SaaS companies, companies in uh, media industry, transportation, manufacturing. Uh, we're on the East Coast. We're out of Atlanta, Georgia. We grew from five employees at the beginning of 2014 to now 235. We'll be 350 by the end of the year. And uh, what I'm most excited about is that when companies put SalesLoft in their sales environment, within 90 days after utilization, we're able to see a 30 plus percent lift in the opportunities created. And the reason is, is that we're taking their go-to-market codifying it into one platform, and then deploying to each and every sales rep or frontline uh, customer interaction person, and then giving them a cadence and rhythm for process of how to communicate with their customers through phone, email, uh, LinkedIn now, especially with the LinkedIn investment, uh, and then other methods. And so uh, it's been a ton of fun, and uh, we're not slowing down anytime soon. Game plan is to build this business up to be IPO ready in 2021, and uh, Thankful for all the folks in the room who are customers and supporters. Thankful for being here. I look forward to answering any questions. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kyle. One of the things that I love so much about SalesLoft is your emphasis on values and human engagement as like the baseline for sales. A lot of us here are partnership managers and we're struggling to connect with our partner channels. It's a very similar thing. Can you talk about why it's been so effective uh, to think about sales from a human values and engagement point of view? Well, what's happening is that uh, there's no shortage of uh, research on the web that shows you that buying has changed, right? Buyers are more informed than ever. Uh, they've got more access than ever. And what's happening is that sellers are still, uh, you know, still want to connect with them. And so there's just this inundation of phone calls, emails, social touch points. The buyer's just being overwhelmed, right? But the problems have also evolved. You know, if you look at your charts from earlier, the reason that things are getting more complex and more technical is that you know, when I buy something now, I, we bought uh, 60,000 square feet of office space and had to buy furniture. And that day, that moment in time, there were more furniture options than it had ever been in the history of mankind. It was more difficult than ever before to buy furniture, right? And so all buyers' challenges are getting more and more difficult. They're evolving. And so the buyer is just yearning for a seller or partner or anyone to rise above the noise and deliver them with a better sales experience. And interestingly enough, as I've moved up to serving more enterprise type companies, what I've learned is that, yes, yeah, selling is really hard, but buying is actually harder. We're going into these organizations with champions and they're saying, all right, well, help us get this deal through, you know, like help us get this, make this happen, right? And so this empathetic, sincere, one-to-one, -one, 
unique, value first, and it led with the customer mentality first. This is the way of the future for engagement. And, uh, and buyers want to buy the way that they want to buy. And so whether that's through partnerships or direct or any methods, uh, it's got to be one where you come with this sincere, unique, value first approach. But also, you've got to build it into where you scale it, where it's repeatable, where you can count on it to, to work long term, where you can scale it up and, and, uh, and, and measure it. Well, that's a good question, too. So a lot of us are like, what, how many of us are like the partnership person at companies? Right, exactly. And scaling human engagement is something that we all struggle with. Yeah. How do you recommend we do it, especially when some of, us, some of our teams are so small? Um, without just straight pitching my own product? Just pitch, <laughs> pitch your own product. No, I, I think what's important is, um, you know, what, what all sales is is communication. Partnership relationships are communication. You're emailing, you're phone calling, you might be going on social and interacting with people. You might be sending handwritten notes, you might be sending swag. You're interacting, you might be meeting in person, right? You're interacting with them, right? And so there are systems now that have been created. In fact, this whole category has emerged. Uh, I, I feel like uh, that our customers are the ones that have designed this category of sales engagement, but it allows you to take all those communications necessary to connect with the buyer and codify them into one place. And so, uh, you know, look on the marketplace for, for solutions that hold you accountable to that. And, uh, and in the last presentation, you saw that sales box just growing and growing. And that's exactly what this is, is it's communications and it's communication software. And it allows you to stay on rhythm uh, so that, you know, before you might have only been able to manage 50 accounts a month or, or 30 accounts a month, and now you're able to ma manage double that. Well, you should look in the marketplace and find sales loft, I think, is actually what you should do. But I have a question over here. Hi, Kyle. Hi, Hi. this is Sunil Patro, founder of SignEasy. Awesome talk. Thanks for uh, emphasizing the values and cultures being a very important asset for a company's long-term success, right? Uh, but as first-time entrepreneurs, right, um, sometimes you don't know that you have to set the values and culture on day one, right? And you are a few years down the journey. Your company is doing well. You could do great if you can fix the values, right? So how do you, you know, start an exercise where now you want to kind of, you know, make it clear that, hey, from today onwards, we're going to give the topmost importance. And if you feel resistance from existing team members versus, it's easier to kind of tell to new team members, here is the values, okay. you have to live those. Yeah. But the existing team members who have been there with you for a long time, you will feel some resistance. And second is, do you want to drive it top down, bottoms up, or somewhere in the middle? What has been some of your learnings? Yeah, great question. So the exercise to create the values, no matter what stage you are at, is to take leadership of your organization. It could just be you, it could be you and a board, it could be you and an investor, it could be you and co-founders, it could be you and your C-staff. Bring them together and say, what are the values represented in the people that we admire most, either in this company, out of this company, in ourselves, and write all those values down, right? So now you collect them and get like 30 values or 20 values or those traits, and then mine them out. And you, you, if you're the CEO, you drive this, right? Okay, what about this one? Why this one? Why not that one? And mine it all back to a small set of easily rememberable, memorable values. We started with three and went to five. Um, I, you know, three is great. Five's good, three, is, three, was, three was awesome. Um, you know, we, we fight hard every day to make sure every single person knows all five of those values. Uh, it's harder than if they were three. But mine them down, select them, and then what I like to do is then, uh, you know, if we had, we had positive, that was the word, but we changed it to glass half full because everyone has a connotation of what positive means in their mind, right? But glass half full is kind of a little bit of a different, and I can put a definition on that and then deliver that, and that's now the definition of glass half full which is I can't really redefine the word positive. Um, and so create a phrase out of it that's memorable, uh, define it, and then go to your team and just be transparent. Say, hey, we've been, we've been operating this business without core values at the center of the company. You know, I'm of the belief that we can build a built to last 40 year company if we establish these now, if we align around them, and if we live based on them, right? We operate based on them. That means we fire based on them, we hire based on them, we promote, we demote, we praise, you know, we do all those things with those values. And just, just tell them, hey, so I've made the commitment that we're gonna do this. And if you're not on board with that, then you know, you're not gonna be here on this journey, right? Like, I mean, that, that's, that, you're gonna have to swallow that if you're, if you're willing to make that leap, right? And if you don't align, if you don't feel these values in your heart, then that's not gonna work either, right? I tell candidates, I say, you might 
slip by. You might slip by, but what's going to happen is you're going to show up on day 36 and you're going to be so miserable because everybody here is glass half full and you're not. And you're going to be like, man, I, don't even, I feel like I'm being judged here. I feel like I'm not fit in here. I feel like this is not the place for me. You're not going to be happy at Sales Loft if these values don't live in your heart. So let's go ahead and figure it out now, right? It's like, it's like Jeff Bezos or the guy from uh, um, Zappos saying, hey, I'll give you $10,000 on day one to leave. Right? It's that kind of concept. Uh, so that's what I would do and then, and then present them. And, and you won't get them perfect, by the way. You'll come back two quarters later and you'll be like, you know what? We worded it this way, but I really feel this way represents it better. It's, it's more memorable. It's more sticky. It makes more sense. You know, I've gotten some feedback from people I admire and appreciate. And just, just let it, like, you know, the thing that, that's kind of... Um, Bullshit is when a CEO would say like, okay, these are the new values, you know, here they are, put them up on the screen, but not like share why they are, or how they got to be there, or why that even matters, or why you think you want them up there. Or, and I think they're kind of fearful that people are gonna kind of dig in and see that there's like some messiness in there. But that's where the beauty is, I think. You talk, I find a lot of companies sometimes do values as an exercise, but they're not committed to them. You're using them to hold people accountable. That's scary. Uh, how did you get yourself from where you were before that dumpster fire slide to where yeah. you are now because it's so awesome what you're doing now. One of the big ones is the one minute praise and the one minute reprimand. So we say um, uh, if you see the core values being lived, you catch and address. So hey, remind me your name? Enon. Enon. Yeah. Um, hey, I just saw the way that you operated in that meeting and I love the way that you put the team over your own uh, mo you know, your own personal uh, you know, beliefs or your own personal feelings on this topic. And I just want to say that that's awesome. It's going to help this business out. That's why we are where we are today. And that's how we're going to get to where we need to go. Thank you and keep up the awesome work. Right? That's a one minute, one minute praise. And I do that every single day and train the leadership team to do that every single day. Now, hey, I just saw Enon being rude. I'm going to detect. I'm going to detect it and I'm going to address it. Hey, I saw the way you treated that customer. We're a customer first organization here. Even if they're wrong, even if they screwed up, even if they were mean, you need to treat them with respect. Not treating the customer with respect is not putting the customer first, and that's not going to help us get to where we need to go. You're better than that. I know you are, Enon, because I've seen how you operate. Detect and address, right? One minute reprimand. Now, the goal is to do three to five X one minute praises more than the one minute reprimands, right? Um, but there's just a book, I think it's called One Minute Manager. It's like a simple, it's like a 70 page pamphlet. Um, but it's the one that taught me that. And then I kind of tweaked it to be values-based. No, awesome. Questions? More questions? Come back there. Thanks for sharing everything with where you are now, how your plan looks, the cadence of communication, all those things. But what did it look like when there was just five? Can you talk a little bit about the process of when there's less people to address and kind of all those things and how you kind of found your way to what you have in place and what works now? It's a lot easier when there's less people. Um, so after the reboot, we went back to just me as the only employee of the company. And then I rebuilt the company up, but did it with this in mind. So first person came on board and I spent months with him to decide whether or not we were aligned on the values and how we saw, how we thought you should treat people, what we thought of the outcome, what we wanted to happen with this company. We were able to invest a lot of time into that relationship. And then the next person that came on board, it was like, hey, we gotta make sure that this is the same, you know, that we keep, keep this going, right? And so it was easier in those early days uh, because you're spending so, I mean, I remember in the early days, I like had time to play ping pong. You know, now it's like, you know, I don't have any of that, right? Um, but so I think in the early days, it is easy if you make it intentional and you make it important. Um, and then you got to make sure everyone else is bought in. You can't have someone in there that says this is bullshit. If someone says this is bullshit, then they're just not part of this journey. They could be great people, super smart, awesome people. I enjoy hanging out with them. But you can't be on the sales off team if you think this stuff's bullshit. Because it won't work. We can't have that on the inside, you know? More questions? Back there. So um, if, if I recall correctly, I think you guys w were impacted by LinkedIn when they pulled back the APIs. No. No? Yeah, that was, a, that was a common misbelief. We weren't using the API at all for that product, right? So we were able, so we had built a Chrome extension that operated for the, on the browser of our customers and allowed them to capture the publicly available data that they saw on the web. So if you look through that post, you'll see that highlighted and detailed. And if you look on Quora, there's a Quora question. It's like, why hasn't this happened? You'll see the full details of, of all that. Um, now, what you're leading towards is, did we shut down the product because of that? 
And what I would say is, is that part of our values of being able to deliver for the customer first meant owning and operating the full code base of what SalesLoft was. So the core product did depend on external data sources, which made it more difficult to own and operate that business in a way that would be effective for delivering to our customers. So there was a little bit of a component of what the product did and kind of how the community you know, reacted to it, but it was all about what's the values of business because the business was making a ton of money and wasn't being shut down. So, so we get to dis uh, dispel that, that myth for everyone here. Yeah, I mean, and, and I thought well, that was kind of interesting then that LinkedIn was in the, uh, the most recent funding round. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and the perspective there was is that they're investing heavily in their sales navigator product, which has very similar um, ideals in terms of their mission and vision of that product is to operate in a sales world which is more sincere and authentic and relationship driven or relationship first. And so there was a lot of alignment with SalesLoft's philosophy in theirs. And then they opened up a partnership ecosystem um, that we became part of. And they realized that we were the most um, active member of that partnership. And our customers were um, using the API more than any other customers. And so that led to this relationship that became an investment. What's the most awkward question you've ever been asked during an all-company stand-up? Um, I was asked the most embarrassing thing that I had to share with my parents. And it was like when I was in trouble at high school for something stupid. So yeah, that was kind of a weird one. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the big questions are like, what are you scared about? Like, what is the fears of the company? Like, um, you know, if, if um, like those are the ones that are tough because I think those are the things the CEOs try to hold back on sharing with the team. And I think it's important not to burden the company with my burdens, uh, to, to put them in a you know, sort of a quagmire. Um, so what I do is I take that glass half full perspective, which is here's a, here's a challenge I'm facing as the CEO of this company. Here's how I feel we'll get out of it. And here's my positive path forward that'll help us. But by the way, I'm still open to suggestions, feedback, input, you know, but this is an area that I'm, I'm struggling with or working on. That's when it gets, it gets tough in those situations. Um, conversations about, uh, I think sometimes conversations about diversity and inclusion, which is a big initiative for us, um, and areas we've done well in and areas we haven't done well in, those are always difficult conversations to have, um, but we just you know, plunge straight into them, you know, dive in head first and have those conversations. Um, whenever staff is gone, uh, you know, we uh, had a, a VP of a, of a department that we let go, and the question is, hey, why? And uh, you know, we jump right in, and it's not, you know, I'm not gonna sugarcoat, you know, here's, here's the truth, here's the reality, you know, like, here's, here's what's important to us, and so we have those conversations as well. And uh, you know, I think some people have said, you know, one day you're gonna have to censor yourself, um, but you know, I'm the CEO, and so I kinda get to make that decision. Actually, one of the sub-themes of this event is uh, you know, connecting with other folks when you have a problem. Obviously, you can't burden your staff with your challenges, CEOs, uh, a difficult position. Where do you go to when you need to talk through one of these challenges? Yeah, great question. You know, I hear, I hear, and it makes me a little um, sad when I hear people say the CEO's job is a lonely job. Um, it's a lot of things that are good and bad and challenging, but that's never one that I've ever felt because um, I've created a really g giant support system. Uh, my wife is uh, is about this business, so she's in, uh, all in, and she knows what that means. And if it wasn't for her, we wouldn't be where we are today. And so there's nothing that I won't hide from her about the company. And uh, even in the most toughest moments, uh, you know, I brought them to her and she's been awesome. Uh, my father, I mentioned, I BCC my dad on every, on every weekend update. So he knows the whole journey from end to end. And then I've got a few other mentors that have been on those emails from the very beginning as well. And they'll dive in and, and coach and help. Um, my co-founder, so after I rebooted the company, I hired a gentleman named Rob Foreman who is our COO and, uh, and co-founder of the Rebooted Business. And, uh, and same thing, you know, I like having relationships where there's nothing I won't share with them. I think that's really important, is that you know, when you hide things kind of inside and hold them back, it makes them really, really difficult for you to address them and face them. And that's why you know, when I have new employee meetings and uh, brand new employees come and we do orientation, I tell them my story, kind of similar to the way that I told you all today. And I tell them real authentically, like, Here's, the, here's, here's where I came from. And the reason is, is that if I get it out in the light, kind of out in the open, then it becomes less scary and less, less difficult. And I think that's the way with all challenges. I've been watching, uh, I've, I got this, this horrible um, uh, 
watching Walking Dead. I don't know if anyone ever watched the show. And uh, it's kind of interesting. You like you see these episodes, and when these zombies are like hidden in the dark room behind the scenes, they're like super scary. But if you see them out in the middle of the day, like out on the road, it's like, oh, just go up and stab them, you know? And it's like, that's like my problem. So I should bring them out there, put them in the middle of the road, let the light shine on them, and then just go stab them in the head. That's good advice, to have your problems in the head. I like that. It's fantastic. More questions. I got more, of course. Who has more questions? Okay, here's a question. So that I think, speaking of doing sermons, you know, I know my audience. And so a lot of us are partnership people. I feel, how many of us are intimidated by sales? I mean, I know I am. Is anyone else intimidated by sales? Yes. So, I mean, I'm a computer scientist and a librarian, and I hear I'm running an event, I'm doing sales. And I was telling my <laughs> wife, what have I done wrong with my life that I am doing sales, and all I do is sales these days. Uh, but it's fun. I like the Tony Robbins quote, because if you truly believe in what you're doing and you're helping other people, then your motivation for selling is to help the other person. That's right. Uh, which is my attitude. But can you talk about, you know, how, uh, like, I mean, like, your value-based selling, what, you know, how do you get over the fear of selling? Yeah. So imagine that your uh, best friend in the world, brother, sister, best friend, imagine someone you really, really, really love that trusts you, believes in you, that you could be a confidant for. Now imagine they're about to do something that's totally terrible. They're about to go on a date with this person that you know is wrong. They're about to like, do something bad with drugs or something, you know, something terrible, right? Are you gonna stop and let them do, are you gonna stand by and let them do that? Are you going to get in because you know you love them, you know that what they're doing is wrong, are you going to then transfer your belief to them? Absolutely, everyone in this room is, right? And that's what sales is. It's, uh, I, I like to say that this industry that I'm so passionate about, that I've been involved in my whole life, all it requires is three things. A fundamental belief in your product, whatever it is, product, service uh, that you have, fundamental belief in the company that you represent. If you don't have that, then you don't have much, right, in business. Uh, fundamental belief in product, fundamental belief in company, and then fundamental belief in yourself and your ability to help others. And then all sales is, is a transference of that belief to someone else. That's it. And so when I feel something strongly, and I'm confident, and I've got this deep level belief that I can serve your business to be better, I can help you overcome your challenges, I can take your company to the very next level, I'm doing a disservice in life if I don't step in and help you realize that. And that's what sales is to me. And that's exactly what you're saying. You love this conference, you love this meaning, you love this purpose, you believe in it, and you're just saying, hey man, I'm gonna go tell people about this stuff, because it's good, it's good for them. That's right. Uh, th thank you. Any more questions? We've got certainly some time. Questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. It was amazing. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you so thank much. You.